It's the story of a rich slave-owning dude in Judea who's sold into slavery, becomes a famous chariot driver in Rome, and then returns home to search for his family and do a bit more racing. It's a film that's so big that it even spawned the saying, bigger than Ben-Hur. Well, it's not bigger than Ben-Hur, but a perfectly Ben-Hur-sized film, because it's Ben-Hur. <laughs> Ben-Hur was an 1880 novel that was first turned into a film in 1925, and by 1959, the time was ripe for a retelling of a story subtitled as The Tale of the Christ. No pressure. With television seemingly taking over from both radio and cinema as people's primary form of entertainment, the movie industry shot back with something small 13-inch black and white screens couldn't compete with. Charlton Heston's teeth. Movies could be in colour. Movies could also have, occasionally at least, stereophonic sound. Some were in 3D. And movies could have a widescreen picture that filled the cinema screen. Various competing widescreen formats were introduced and the movie studios used their technological advantage over TV to good advantage to put bums on seats. Spectacle, widescreen colour epics came in many different flavours throughout the 50s. Westerns, period dramas, war films, and of course, biblical epics like the Ten Commandments all of which apparently starred Charlton Heston. If you were an avid moviegoer in the 50s and 60s, you couldn't get away from the f***er. The story of Ben-Hur, despite it being a film close to four hours in length, is fairly simple. Judah Ben-Hur is a rich Jew in Judea, whose old friends with Masala, newly returned as a Roman tribune to Judea. The reunion turns sour when Judah won't rat on friends who aren't happy with the Roman occupation. Funny that. You're either for me or against me then I am against you. When some shoddy workmanship nearly kills the new governor of Judea, Judah Ben-Hur is arrested along with his mother Miriam and sister Tirza. I will pray that you live till I return. Return? Then we skip forward a few years and Ben-Hur is a slave on a Roman galley for Roman consul Quintus Arius. And we have a weird scene where the slaves have to row faster thanks to an over-enthusiastic drummer. When the ship is heavily damaged in a battle, Judah saves Arius's life and returns to Rome and, off screen mind you, becomes the most famous chariot racer in Rome. Now the adopted son of Arius, Judah finally returns home to Judea to find out what happened to his mum and sister. But yeppers, yeppers, they're now lepers. Meanwhile, Judah has hooked up with an old girlfriend, Esther, and when we say old girlfriend, we mean she was his slave before she was freed. Judah challenges his old mate Masala to a chariot race and the film's most iconic and brutal scene takes place. This is the day, Judah. It's between us now. Yes, this is the day. An extended chariot race that is both spectacular, exhilarating and really rather violent for a late 50s film sees Oof. Judah win the race while Masala is trampled by his own horses. The mortally wounded Masala somehow knows exactly where the her women are, or the her hers, and they're in the Valley of, Valley the, lepers, of the Lepers, also known as Leper Town, the Tender Leper, the Big L. Lots of names for a place that has sewn up the leprosy suffering demographic like a sack full of corn flour. Esther and Judah take the leper ladies to find a guy they know. The guy is some fella who's been blogging about peace and love and all that crap all over Judea. A guy we see in long shot and from behind but never actually hear or see from the front. Oh, it's Jesus Christ who's about to be crucified but then still finds time to cure the woman of leprosy. The end. The source book was long, so the movie was always going to be a long affair, even after being whittled down to a reasonable, well not reasonable, maybe more accurately, a more manageable 212 minutes. It's a film that takes its time to tell its story, dwelling on some events, jumping ahead in time for others. There are a few major action scenes in the film. A major naval battle is a credit to the FX people, though at this point I can't be sure this is footage from Ben-Hur or Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag. And of course the famous chariot race. Oof. It's all done live and in camera. No dodgy back projection or blue screen. It looks dangerous and visceral and I wince every time I see Oof. a chariot racer going under the legs of the horses. Uh, I got horse shit in my mouth. Don't, 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 Heston looks like don't, he's actually don't, driving don't, these don't, things, and the various don't, competitors don't, being injured don't, or maimed or worse is don't, astonishingly don't. visceral, something you really wouldn't expect from a 1959 movie. Damn, my phone was in my pocket. 
The final scenes of Jesus dying on the cross are a good metaphor for this movie. Here, mate, get down from there. We need the wood. The women cower in a cave during a storm, and it looks like it was filmed in about five minutes in a live TV studio, and it's then intercut with some beautifully composed shots of the crucifixion. Just as he became famous as a gun advocate later in life, Heston obviously liked guns, since they made him feel comfortable. But how does a gun lover fare in a film set at a time a millennium and a half before guns were invented? Well, Heston's costumes were designed so that Heston could discreetly carry some of his favourite pistols while filming, with a 9mm pistol strapped to each ankle, a 44 Magnum under his toga, and an ammo bandolier and two hand grenades sewn into his skirt. And well, he's got one here somewhere. Ben-Hur was filmed in an ultra-wide aspect ratio. This is old-fashioned TV with an aspect ratio of 4 to 3. That is a screen that's slightly longer than it is high, like a prone stoner drinking coffee. This is a modern HD TV with an aspect ratio of 177 to 1, where the length is 1.77 times the height of the picture. Most widescreen movies are either 185 or, for a more epic feel, 2.35 to 1. Ben-Hur being the epic it was, is filmed at an aspect ratio of 700 to 1. If you saw a showing of this film in its original aspect ratio and sat in the back row of the theatre, this is what you would get. Okay, you can't expect naturalistic dialogue performances from something set during the Roman Empire. There's a Jew outside. But if you compare Ben-Hur to its natural genre mate Spartacus, reviewed here, there's a world of difference. Ben-Hur doesn't have the hustle of Spartacus, and as a result it feels a little, not a lot, but a little slow-witted. While the acting is pretty good, the dramatic scenes suffer due to the staging. It's a movie made to be seen in widescreen, so that expansive vistas and action look great, but the dramatic scenes do tend to look like someone filmed a stage production. It's bigger than Ben-Hur doesn't take into account sometimes you need to make it a bit more intimate. It does have a rousing melodic score by Miklos Rosa ready to wake you when you nod off when it gets too pious. Yet God once spoke to me out of the darkness, and a star led me to a village called Bethlehem, where I found a newborn child in a manger. Oh, the piety. I heard him say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Lots and lots of piety. And now, I must say goodnight to my beauties. When they are ready for sleep, they get impatient and jealous. They wait to see which one I will embrace. For a film that's mostly about Ben-Hur getting back to Judea to look for his mother and sister, eventually, the film has to try and justify its subtitle, A Tale of the Christ. This is despite Jesus being a cameo played by a walk-on, who's only there because the story paints itself into a corner with giving the Hur-Hurs leprosy, and they needed to somehow magically be cured by the end of the last reel. Old films weren't always averse to having a downbeat ending. Please die. In fact, many of the great films do end on a downer, like when you eat a cupcake frosted with crushed sleeping tablets. But here, everything is wrapped up neatly. In this day and age, Ben-Hur is just an unusual film. Spartacus led a revolution. Ben-Hur just hangs out in Rome for a few years, racing chariots with the run of the town while his mother and sister rot in a prison back east. The lack of urgency in some scenes really makes the film hard to watch. <laughs> Thank you. Despite featuring several really, really exciting sequences like the sea battle and the iconic chariot race. It is epic, it is mostly well made, and the acting is, well, it's enough to get you through the experience, if it's not exactly sparkling. I crossed this floor and spoke in friendship, as I would speak to Arius. But when I go up those stairs, I become the hand of Caesar. This film made a massive impact in its day. It won Academy Awards for Best Picture, Best Actor, Best Supporting Actor, Best Director, Best Cinematography, Best Art Direction, Best Costume Design, Best Sound, Best Film Editing, Best Effects and Best Music. The only nomination it didn't win was for Best Writing. What a loser! Ben-Hur made a lot of money on its original release and became a perennial favourite on TV for decades, particularly at Christmas and Easter. And despite being an iconic film, people still try to remake it. There was a 2010 miniseries from Canada and a 2016 feature film that sank faster than Titanic on double speed. If you only watch one film called Ben-Hur this year, make sure it's this one. I am Judah Ben-Hur. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below, or check out some of our other videos.